Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients needed for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line based on the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research that closes the nutrient gap so you can feel and perform your best. Unlike most supplements that contain cheap synthetic ingredients your body can't absorb, we use clinician-grade bioavailable ingredients to make a real and noticeable difference. Our products are manufactured in a CGMP facility without gluten or GMOs, and they're third-party tested to validate ingredients and confirm they're free of contaminants like heavy metals. We have a full range of products from the most advanced multivitamin and phytonutrient formula on the market to a blend of eight organic superfood mushrooms, including reishi, chaga, and lion's mane, to a one-of-a-kind fish oil with bioavailable forms of curcumin and black seed oil. Our newest product is BioVail Colostrum Plus, a blend of cold-processed colostrum from grass-fed cows, lactoferrin, and beta-glucan. These ingredients nourish the microbiome, fortify the gut, skin, and other barriers to keep pathogens, toxins, and other foreign substances out, fine-tune immunity to prevent hyperactive or inappropriate responses, and support the gut and immune system in numerous other ways. BioVail Colostrum Plus provides a powerful yet natural and safe way to protect against seasonal threats, balance and calm the immune response, and rebuild a healthy gut ecosystem. Head to AdaptNaturals.com to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. I have a real treat for you today. I'm talking with Dr. Dave Rabin, who is a medical doctor and a PhD, neuroscientist, board certified psychiatrist, health tech entrepreneur and inventor who's been studying the impact of chronic stress in humans for more than a decade. He's also the co-founder and CMO at Apollo Neuroscience, which has developed one of the best wearables in the space that improves energy focus and relaxation. Also significant impact on sleep, uh, stress management, resilience, and even uh, feelings of relaxation and, and calm in social situations. It's a device I've been using myself for several years and have recommended to lots and lots of patients with great results. Um, so I had a conversation with Dave about the roots of this kind of therapy, of touch therapy more generally, which of course uh, starts from the very moment that we're born and we have skin-to-skin -skin contact uh, between the mother and child, and then the role of the vagus nerve in stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system response, which is the opposite of fight or flight and the rest and digest response and techniques that we can use to stimulate uh, the vagus nerve and, and put ourselves in that more relaxed state. And then how the Apollo device contributes to that sense of relaxation and rest and helps to rewire our nervous system in ways that make us more resilient in the face of chronic stress that we all experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Dr. Rabin also is active in the field of using psychedelic interventions for uh, PTSD and chronic pain. And so we talked about how psychedelic therapy overlaps with touch and sensory methods uh, and the Apollo device. He's doing a study right now on ketamine and the Apollo wearable, which just is, is fascinating to me because of the incredible results that ketamine-assisted therapy has shown with depression and other conditions. So it's a really fascinating conversation. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's dive in. Dr. Dave Rabin, pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to begin by talking a little bit about the origins of sensory or touch therapy. This is, you know, a I would uh, not new, of course. It's this touch therapy goes way back, but at least uh, some of the newer applications uh, that have come on, like the Apollo device, uh, are relatively new. But they they have deep roots in human physiology and connection. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and it's one of my favorite topics. So, you know, I think the the best way to understand the meaningfulness of touch is to really look beyond beyond human. Let's look back into the you know old world mammals and the mammals who have been on the earth a lot longer than we have. And every single mammal, every single great ape, 
um, and every single ape ever uh, has nursed their young and coddled their young when they were born, right? And this is the very first after, you know, birth from the womb, which is in and of itself a physically traumatic, harrowing experience for the uh, newborn, then gets its immediate first safety signals from mom or parents, but usually mom. And that is a a nonverbal communication through sense of touch because the newborn can't understand words or verbalization at that point. So it's just fresh, right? And so touch is the most instant way that we can send safety signals to each other and that we have evolved to send safety signals to each other. Safety being the signal that amplifies vagus nerve activity or parasympathetic nervous system activity, um, which is responsible for all of our recovery systems and functions in the body, like sleep, digestion, immunity, reproduction, empathy. So, so this is universally important to the way that we recover and the way we heal and the way we stay healthy and fight off illness. And uh, yeah, that's, and that's kind of the, the ancient origins. There's lots of other places it comes from too, but that's where it starts. So this is the antidote. This is the rest and digest system. We're talking about parasympathetic, which is the flip side of the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system arousal that is perhaps the defining feature of Western civilization in many ways is set up to chronically activate that system. But we're talking about this, this touch that infants experience as that first safety signal is not just a nice to have, right? Like I, I seem to have recalled reading either research or some kind of editorial that in some cases, if, if an infant is deprived of touch, it can even be fatal. Um, that, or, or at least it, some very serious problems can develop. It's, it's not a luxury. It's actually something that's deeply hardwired and necessary for normal development. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true uh, in the case of it being necessary for normal development. And that's, that's why actually some of the original, uh, or maybe not original, but the o- oldest use of vibration technology has been in incubators of premature babies. And um, when they can't, they have to be on some sort of life support so they can't be around mom or around anybody else who's touching them. You know, they have, we have like the doctors and the nurses come in and 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 we lovingly touch the baby and, but we're also examining the baby. So it's not exactly the same as a mother's unconditional love, you know, especially your mother's. And so it's, you know, one of the, the tools that has been used is to try to, to replicate at least some of that physical sensation of touch. It's not the whole thing, but it's at least some percentage of it by using gentle vibrations that get delivered through the bed um, to these, these premature infants that help them to have better survival rates, uh, which is really incredible. Uh, but touch is absolutely essential. And I think one of the things that many of us did have some at least more more touch, loving touch, hugs, things like that as kids than we do as adults. But part of the problem is that, you know, as adults, we're still kind of big babies in some ways. Like we we really do still need certain things like that we needed as kids, like soothing touch and hugs and um and affection and intimacy. And and you know, those are all critical parts of feeling safe and connected. And for some reason, as we get older, we just start to deprioritize those things but they are critically important for our health, mental health and emotional health and well-being and survival. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's I know I've seen research uh, uh, suggesting that people who are married or in a committed relationship often live longer than people who are not. And I imagine that plays some role, just that intimacy and affection and touch and warmth that is so core and essential to who we are as human beings. And the lack of that, you know, maybe actually, you know, having such a big impact that it can shorten our lifespan. And of course, that's not always in, in our control, you know, whether we're, we have a partner or not into our old age, but it, it, it definitely drives home the importance of this and how it affects not just our mental health, but also our, our physical health. It's uh, love to chat about that a little bit because we know now that chronic activation of the sympathetic nervous system being in a, in a perpetual fight or flight response has 
broad and diverse effects, right? It, it contributes to virtually every chronic disease that we know about from cardiovascular disease to GI conditions to dementia and Alzheimer's. Can you talk a little bit about the way that, you know, our stress system evolved initially and maybe kind of what the con conditions were uh, for most of, of our hominid evolutionary history and then how that's changed in modern Western civilization, what the impacts of that uh, are for us. Yeah, uh, it's it's really interesting, right? So if you think about, and, and Eric Handel won the Nobel Prize for discovering this in part with respect to the way we learn and remember safety and fear responses and store that memory in our brains, which is something that he was originally studying in ancient sea snails from 300 million years ago. And so if you put your, try to close your eyes and put your mind into the body of an ancient sea snail with a little, you know, little, little uh, shell and and you're just kind of like, you know, snailing around and looking for food. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, you see you or smell uh, or, you, you know, your antennae sense a predator or something around you that could eat you. Right. And so then something sets you off and you're like, okay, I have to go hide. Right. Or I have to go do something to get to safety. Um, forget about food, forget about everything else. Right. And so evolutionarily, that over the course of hundreds of millions of years, we evolved to our nervous systems are doing basically the same thing in response to fear and threat. And then when that threat's gone, that's that snail goes, oh, okay, this threat's gone. I can go back and search for food again. Right. And so that balance, and of course, it's not just food in, in, in many cases, it's like food and reproductive opportunities right? Very similar to humans. What do we care about, right? We care about food, we care about reproductive opportunities, we care about shelter, comfort, right? You know, we're not that different. Um, and so, so Eric Handel won the Nobel Prize for that work around memory and showing that the, the, the high similarities between these different species, like over hundreds of millions of years is conserved. And so what that really teaches us is that, you know, uh, a couple things, right? Like, Practice makes mastery because the more we're doing anything, the better we get at it. And so that results in this like learned behavior thing that keep that goes, which is how we learn, which is you do something, you repeat it, you repeat it, and you repeat it until you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. And we we've, we've all done things like that, like driving, right? Is a very common one, putting on our clothes in the morning, um, different things, the feeling of our clothes on our bodies. Like you just do it and then you forget about it. And so stress. It evolved in the way that we originally evolved that system to deal with the immediate threat, like predator, lack of air, lack of water, lack of food. Um, and those are the things that we evolved that parasympathetic rest and digest sympathetic fight or flight system. The fight or flight system is dealing with that survival stuff. And once we get into safety mode, we can go back to thinking about food and reproduction and comforts and being emp empathetic with each other. But when we're in survival mode, we evolve to not do or prioritize any of those things. And what that means in our bodies is that there's a redistribution of resources because there's only so much blood to go around to feed any part of our bodies at any given time. So the body in times of stress constricts blood flow to all of our parts of our bodies that are not critical for survival. And then dilates blood vessels to our heart, our lungs, our motor cortex of our brain, our skeletal muscles, which take a ton of blood, our fear center of our brains, and all the parts that are like critically important for getting out of a survival situation, right? Like a survival situation of predators, food, lack of food, lack of water, lack of air, right? Real survival situations. And that's what our body knows. And our body can't tell the difference between perceived threat and actual threat. Our mind can if we train it, but our bodies can't. Our bodies just know threat or safety. Right. So your stock portfolio crashing is triggering the same set of limbic system and nervous system responses as a lion stalking you uh, until you're able to cognitively work out that that's a different threat. Your body basically responds in that same way or a similar way, at least. And it seems to me that's the crux of the issue because for you know in, in the modern world now we have a, a capacity through our frontal cortex and the way that we're living to be constantly thinking about 
perceived threats or experiencing perceived threats, maybe getting cut off in traffic. I mean, that is actually, that, that could be a real threat <laughs> in that that's case. A, that's a really, that's a really good one. Yeah. Getting cut off in traffic, you know, something happened financially. I mean, there's any number of things that are just almost this constant stream of threats that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And what you're saying is our biological, relatively kind of binary stress response system was not set up to deal with that originally. Yeah. And, and not just that, but like you add on to that, the news, right? The news, just that in and of itself, add on work responsibility. Social media, technology, social media. phones in your pocket, always beeping and flashing and constantly tucking our attention. Right. Responsibilities to your family, your kids, right? Your parents. You know, all of it. And, and all of that is just an incredibly overstimulating for us. Like I think a study showed that we're, you know, estimated that we're consuming as much information in the first 30 minutes of being awake now, than I think this is two years, two years ago, but because of smartphone technology, we're consuming as much as we were, we, we, as much information in 30 minutes as we did in a week in the 1950s. Wow. Right. Which is a huge evolutionary mismatch as well, because we evolved in these close knit tribal social groups and maybe 100 to 150 people and not in a situation where we're constantly aware of what's happening thousands or tens of thousands of miles away on the planet um, at all times. So, yeah, I mean, I, this this is something with patients that I always have discussed because I think it's often the elephant in the room um, in, in health conversations where you know, somebody could be eating pretty well, doing pretty good job with exercise and, and other stuff. But if this piece, if there's not really an active effort to mitigate the impacts of this kind of chronic hyper stimulation of the fight or flight response or the sympathetic nervous system, all of those efforts, they're not going to be in vain because they certainly will help, but they're not going, you know, they're, they're going to be diminished in their impact because this is the sort of hyper activation of this system affects everything, including even how we digest that healthy food we're eating, right? Because of what you just said, if, yeah. if your body perceives that your, your survival is threatened, it doesn't really care about digesting the meal you just ate. It's prioritizing other things and certainly doesn't care with, about your fertility or, you know, longer term hormonal regulation or things like that. It's going to prioritize everything needed for that immediate term survival. So given that this is the situation we are all in, you know, let's talk about some of the ways we know of to activate the parasympathetic response, you know, maybe starting with the vagus nerve and its importance in the parasympathetic system. And then we can talk about, you know, vagus nerve stimulation exercises and the Apollo device and how that fits in. Um, to give people some idea about how to how to actually mitigate uh, some of this stress. It, honestly, most of us at this point can't avoid. We can we can make choices to minimize it, but I think it's impossible for most people at this stage if they're living in 21st century modern Western world to eliminate it entirely and probably not even desirable. It's a it's a feature of life to some extent. Yeah, absolutely right. So so I think it starts with it's it starts with understanding the good news and the bad news. So the bad news is that stress is inevitable, as you just said, right? It's not going, it's not ever going completely away. Um, it's, there's always going to be something that's, that is stressful and that we need to deal with or adapt to. And um, the, what does change, however, is our perception of stress as an opportunity for growth, because if we weren't stressed or challenged, we wouldn't actually be able to grow and develop as human beings. That's how we grow. That's how we learn new stuff is we have to do stuff that's hard. And that's just how we don't understand. And that's how it works, right? That's how it's always worked for learning for, for all animals, but especially for us. So the, so, so that's like the, the, that's the bad news, but the good news is that we, there, there's hope. You know, like we can, we understand how the brain works now, uh, much better than we did, you know, even 20, 30 years ago to the point where, where we understand that it's possible to retrain our brains to do, to perform at a higher level, to do what they, what we were taught they were supposed to be doing with our emotions and our thoughts and our memories and, um, the way we regulate ourselves and how much energy we have and how much, how easy it is to fall asleep at night, right? Like all of that is trainable and it's through practice and, 
there's and regulating anxiety and mood and mood, right? Like all of this can be trained through practice. And, you know, the core of it, despite all the other things we might be doing is, you know, number one, to just constantly remind ourselves that we're safe, right? That we're actually not under survival threat right now. And um, that's something important that can we can remind ourselves by in our bodies, by breathing, um, by doing giving yourself a hug, by doing like what we call somatic techniques, techniques that bring our minds back into our bodies. Um, and all of these techniques, and these techniques are are also called vagal techniques. Um, and we talked, I think we talked briefly about the vagus nerve earlier, which is you know, getting a lot of popularity right now because people are finally starting to understand what we've known for quite a long time, which is that the vagus nerve is the most critical nerve innervating all the, all of our, almost all of our organs in our entire body and almost our entire body that communicates the signal of basically, not in all cases, but in most cases, the signal of calming down and recovery. So recovery meaning digestion, reproduction, immunity, metabolism, creative thinking, empathy, all of it, sleep, all of it, the whole thing, emotion regulation, right? That feeling of flow, all of it is encompassed in this recovery nervous system that we call the vagus nerve, nerval, vagal nerve system or the parasympathetic nervous system. And this system is opposing the sympathetic system, the fight or flight system we talked about earlier. They're fighting for resources and so if we remind ourselves, if we think we're afraid, sympathetic fight or flight gets more resources, then the rest of our system is depleted, our recovery system. If we remind, as we remind ourselves that we're safe, we restore the balance of resources and allow the body to understand through training it that we're actually not under survival threat right now in this moment. And if, because if we were, we wouldn't be able to take the time to think about it or to take a deep breath or to give ourselves a hug or to do any of these things, right? And so there's a positive feedback loop in of training that occurs where we remind ourselves that we're safe in situations that used to feel threatening. And this is an old technique in psychology. It's so, you know, talking about it like now is, is really like funny because it still hasn't been fully adopted and accepted despite how true it is and how well it's been practiced. But what we're talking about became the field of cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure, a prolonged exposure, which is the leading psychotherapy treatment for PTSD uh, currently that is available. And it's also the leading intervention for insomnia, I believe, as well, or one of the first first line of treatment for insomnia at this point. Yeah, CB, yeah, CBTI. But that's yeah, but that's CBTI, different. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a different approach. But the exposure approach is really interesting because the whole idea of cognitive behavioral therapy with exposure is you're exposing the person who is afraid of X thing or situation or person to thoughts, images, people who look like, or things that look like that. And then the actual thing in the context of a safe environment. Right. And we're with the therapist present to hold that safe space and make sure that person remembers that they're safe. And then that person learns safety again in situations to feel threatening. And it's a beautiful technique and it works really well but it requires a silly amount of work for both therapist and patient. It's just, it's a little costly and it, it's just very time consuming. And so what we, when we were doing this work at the University of Pittsburgh, we realized that if we understood that the SAGE pathway was as critical as all the evidence seems to be pointing to it with, then perhaps we could, by activating and creating technology to activate this, the soothing touch mechanisms in our nervous system and our skin and our bones that are the same things get activated when you get a hug or you hold a purring cat um, that we could start to give you that feeling of that therapist being by your side or that person that you trust to feel safe around being by your side anywhere you go and we started testing that using uh, electricity and and vibration sound waves that are low frequency um, that are oscillating at certain different breath rhythms and we found that specific rhythms that were crafted in a very specific way uh, could fairly rapidly, like two to three minutes in a highly controlled setting in the lab uh, at the university, they could actually increase heart rate variability under stress, decrease heart rate, and improve cognitive performance proportionately to the amount that the body was improving its functioning. And so it allowed us to understand how vibration affects the body when you don't even hear it, it's just felt through your skin, through your chest, through your wrist, and that can actually have 
cardiorespiratory effects in very short time and co significant cognitive effects. Um, this was in double-blind randomized placebo-controlled crossover studies. So we were like pretty blown away. And then from there, we, you know, continued to develop uh, the technology. My wife started the company um, and then hired me in 2018. And we commercialized the technology as Apollo Neuroscience in 2020. Great. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about Apollo and some of the research behind it. Uh, I know you've done studies on, well, first of all, maybe you can just explain uh, what the device is, what it looks like, how it's worn, and just some of the basics for people who are not familiar with it. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about the use cases. Uh, I know you've done studies on sleep that showed, uh, I think, if I recall, a 30-minute increase in sleep, including improvements in deep sleep. And then you've done studies on, on stress um, that indicate an increase in heart rate variability uh, and improved cognitive performance. And so, yeah, I would just love to, you know, start with an overview of the device and how people are, are wearing it and using it throughout the week, and then talk a little bit about the research behind it. Sure. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, Apollo is a wearable device that is a pod that you can wear anywhere on your body with a clip um, during the day, I often wear it with a clip in between my buttons on my chest, um, and at night I wear it on my ankle. I think the ankle is actually the most popular spot because of how good it feels and how nicely it works down there. Yeah, that's my preference as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the best, especially for sleep. So the feeling of Apollo, if anybody's listening and has an iPhone, by the way, you can actually go to the App Store and download the Apollo Neuro app and actually feel the Apollo experience um, as a demo so that you can understand what we're talking about. But basically, if you've ever held a purring cat and you, or you've ever, you know, gotten a hug from a friend and you, you feel this like gentle wave of like warm fuzzies, um, that feeling is a feeling that we can access with breathing states, just by breathing at a certain rate, you can naturally bring yourself into that state. And one version of that, that we've probably all heard of is, is ohm meditation, right? So you're like, making a sound that creates and, and it's and breathing at a certain rate that creates these resonance patterns in the body to help get us into a certain state of feeling and consciousness and experience. And so um, people use Apollo to improve their ability to change states and to regulate their circadian cycles because it calm the gentle vibrations calm the body uh, and bring the body into a slightly more vagal state or a slightly more focused state or a slightly more uh, wakeful, creative, social, relaxed, recovered. Uh, and then there's unwind and sleep. And so you can manually just activate these as you wish on the app. You can, go, we, recommend, we recommend that people go in and, and schedule them and we customize a schedule to your personal lifestyle and chronotype because we know that chronotype science is starting to show some promise. And this is the understanding that we all have a certain time. Uh, we all have a diurnal cycle, which is like a day and night cycle. And we all have certain times where we are better at focusing and better at having energy and better at being physical and better at sleeping and getting that deep restorative restful sleep. And they might be different for you and me um, slightly. And so and different for different ages, right? Teenagers and, and my daughter's. Right. 12, almost 13, and she used to be an early riser, and now she's sleeping like a teenager, you know, staying up late at night and sleeping in. If only schools were um, more aware of this and it was easier to shift school schedules, do, you know, along with chronotypes, I think that would be a big improvement, but I, I digress. Um, so yeah. it sounds really cool. I, that's one of the things I like about Apollo most is just the ability to customize the the various routines throughout the day. And, and, and because my schedule will sometimes shift and um, I'll have a different, you know, different use cases. And then you can just override and do it manually as well if you want a particular mode at a specific point in time. So that's super helpful. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think there's one other thing that I want to tell you about. I don't know if you, if, did we give you smart vibes yet? Have you been using no, it? No, because yeah. So I don't have the latest version and, and, and I, I lost, unfortunately, in my recent move, oh, I, I, it was in a box and that box disappeared along with some other <laughs> cool stuff that I haven't been able to find. Exactly. So well, I hope no, you find I it. I don't have that yet. If you've listened to the show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. 
Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy-to-use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day, and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. You've probably heard a lot about colostrum lately, and for good reason. Colostrum is Mother Nature's perfect first food. It's the nutrient-rich fluid female mammals produce in the first few days after giving birth and is packed with essential nutrients, antibodies, growth factors, and other bioactive compounds. Colostrum nourishes the gut microbiome, supports the mucosal barriers, protects against infections, and modulates the immune response. It's no exaggeration to say that supporting our gut immune axis is one of the most important things we can do to improve our overall health and extend our lifespan. That's why I'm so excited to tell you about BioVail Colostrum Plus from Adapt Naturals. It contains 2.5 grams of colostrum per serving, which is two and a half times more than most competitors. This is critical because studies documenting colostrum's benefits typically use a dose of two grams or more. We source our colostrum from grass-fed, pasture-raised farms across the U.S., and it's free from pesticides, heavy metals, antibiotics, and hormones. It also has higher immunoglobulin content than competing products, 40% versus 25%, and it's cold processed to keep the fragile immunoglobulins and other nutrients intact. But I didn't stop there. I included two more compounds that support gut and immune health, lactoferrin and beta-glucan. Lactoferrin plays a vital role in defending against microbial invaders, promoting gut health, and enhancing the immune system's effectiveness. Beta-glucan is a biological response modifier that trains the immune system to function more efficiently. It's also a prebiotic that nourishes the growth of beneficial bacteria. BioVail Colostrum Plus is the first and only product on the market to contain all three of these powerful yet gentle and safe ingredients. Visit adaptnaturals.com to learn more and place your first order. Well, let me tell you about Smart Vibes because you're going to you're going to love this. We've been working on this feature for like 5 years. So, we we figured out when we did this aura ring study, this gets into the sleep story. So you've seen aura ring, right? You've seen Apple watch. Like this is an amazing product, like, like our product, they work really well. It's really great at tracking it, you know, and it, and, but it's, but it's just tracking you. So when you use it, like, or you use your Apple watch or your whoop or your Fitbit or your Garmin, it tells you information about your sleep or about your stress or about your activity or any number of things it's adding more, you're adding more information to your life and not really knowing what to do about it. And it's actually changing the way people feel. And, and, you know, 50% of people from a lot of some survey studies, you know, up to 50% of people are actually just like shelving these things, the shelving wearables in general that are fitness trackers because they get data fatigue. And so, you know, we thought, okay, we're working with Aura Ring. Um, we were doing research with them, uh, and we started like a 1,300 person sleep study that we conducted that we that we crowdsourced because COVID shut down every sleep lab in the country indefinitely. So all of our sleep studies in 2020, early 2020, that were set to to start off got canceled indefinitely. And so we were like, who could we do the study with? And Aura Ring was really research friendly, and so we were you know we went over and started asking our users to donate their data, and they did. And we tracked 1,300 people over three years to the tune of over a hundred million data points that of their aura ring data and their Apollo data 
uh, and usage data from just buying it and using it out of the box, no instructions. And so this this study is what we're what will be published in the next three to six months or so. Um, but it's one of the biggest sleep studies probably that's ever been done of of an actual like observational sleep study of its kind, which is really interesting. And we showed that just adding Apollo to your life, just adding it to your life, regardless of how you use it, is significantly improving your sleep. It's a small amount, so that across all variables, across all variables, like drinking alcohol and using drugs and, you know, wearing the devices improperly and staying up too late and, you know, everything else that people do across all variables, just adding Apollo statistically significantly improves sleep. So then we said, okay, well, how do we figure out who's getting like the biggest benefits and having the most best results with this tool? And we started to look at the patterns of usage and we found that people using it for three or more hours a day, five days a week, and ideally seven, if you're using it that much and there's a little bit of daytime use and a lot of nighttime use, then people will have a 95% chance of having a statistically significant improvement to their sleep at 21 days. And over three months, that's 30 minutes, more, up to 30 minutes more sleep that's concentrated in deep and REM sleep concentrate in deep and REM sleep. So give you give me an impression of what that what that means. Ambien, which is one of our best pharmaceutical sleep aids, gives 22 minutes of sleep that doesn't make deep or REM sleep better. If anything, it sometimes makes it worse. Worse. Yeah. Right? Cuz it's a, it's a sedative hypnotic benzo family drug and that's the side effect of those drugs and Apollo is getting you, you know, up to 30 minutes with concentrated deep and REM cuz it's just naturally augmenting vagal tone slightly to help us transition more smoothly into sleep. Um, and that has cardiovascular impl implications, which we'll be publishing in a follow-up study. And so in short, that was the work from seeing the impact on sleep um, that was so dramatic for people. We took that data and we trained Apollo to track sleep and to intake data from the Aura Ring so that whenever people sync it up, we can understand when you're in a state that is a stress state or a state that's like, you're not feeling quite yourself or quite your best. And we can send you Apollo vibes to help you feel more like your best because we know what works for you by training uh, predictive and generative AI to work in the background. So now we can actually predict, for instance, like think about like when you apply AI to a health product, a wearable health product, the kinds of things that you can do. So we figured out how to solve unwanted middle of the night wake ups. Wow. So that's huge. That's sleep. Sleep uh, maintenance, insomnia, especially as people age, is so common. Did you know there's not a single product that is not medication? And we don't recommend people taking medications when they wake up in the middle of the night because they make them grow up usually during the day. But there's not a single product that solves this problem to date in the in the history of insomnia. Nobody has been able to solve this problem. Yeah, it's definitely the hardest one I've, you know, for, for as a clinician that I deal with. Right. And same. And so we were just like, well, AI can run in the background. What if we just train the AI on the Apollo itself the, to sense your motion position, which is the most reliable way to assess sleep states, train that against other wearables, and then make it really accurate. So now it's tracking when you're asleep and when you're awake, as well as any of the other wearables, and when you're about to be awake after having been asleep, right? And so if we can understand when you're about to be awake after having been asleep, we can understand when to turn Apollo on to prevent you from waking up. And then we can tell whether it worked or not because we're sensing the motion. And then we can train it to work better for you over time based on your personal sleep patterns. So we're seeing people using this. We've now tracked like 7,000 people over eight months. Uh, and we've seen some like people who wake up in the middle of the night, people who fall into this category who are like relatively, like that's a problem for them that they wake up and they can't get back to sleep. We see some of these people getting 60 minutes more sleep a night. 60 wow. minutes is that's incredible. Deep just through anticipatory technology, right? So that's what you have to look forward to when you get your new Apollo. I'm excited. Um, so tell me about the difference between Smart Vibes just with the Apollo and then Smart Vibes with Aura, because I know just from the little I've read about it, you uh, you can integrate Apollo with Aura and that will add some additional data. So so what what's the difference there? What do you get when you add the Aura uh, versus just the Apollo alone? So, so this is a really cool feature that we just released as well, which is the 
it, you know, what we figured out was Apollo can do the nighttime stuff by itself. It can detect in real time when you're about to wake up and prevent you from waking up. But uh, having more data from other devices that measure your heart rate and your heart rate variability and your activity more accurately and other things that we don't do as well, um, we can pull that data in from them and then use that data to actually customize a solution. Uh, so if Aura tells you that you didn't sleep well last night and you're gonna and you're kind of tired or you might be tired today, uh, we can give you vibes that keep you up and give you energy. And we use generative AI to then compose rhythms of vibe of vibration patterns for you that are scientifically validated that just gently nudge your energy up and down to where it needs to be throughout the day, um, which is especially impactful when you've had a rough night last night or you know a rough week at work. Because I can tell you, I've been having, you know, work running a startup is hard and, uh, and this thing really helps. Absolutely. So um, what are uh, some of the most, you know, we've talked a little bit about sleep, but you, there's also kind of obviously stress management application and then even a social application. I think people are probably least familiar with the social application. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think people are, are you, uh, you know, the social application of this is, is really along the lines of like, remember when we were like the COVID quarantines were all kind of wrapping up and, you know, they told us we could take our masks off and everybody was starting to hang out again for the first time in a really long time. You remember that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You remember like some people or yourself being a little bit uncomfortable being back in that environment. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a, that, that phenomenon is just like a, a distance or creates an unfamiliarity. And in that context, right. We often think like, what is it? Time makes the heart grow fonder or whatever, but distance or time, both yeah, distance or time, <laughs> time apart, time apart makes the heart grow fonder. But I think that in this case, we were taught to be afraid of each other. Right. And we were taught to worry that the person we're interacting with could get us sick. And so there, and we might not be able to know, right? and we could get our whole family sick, right? And this is like, a, and you could die, right? And, and this was like a big communications nightmare. And people had, you know, this triggers our fear response that even subconsciously, even if we're like, oh no, I don't care about any of that anymore. There's still a part of us that interacts with somebody that has been trained over three years to think for the first time when you meet somebody new without a mask on that this person could get me and my whole family ill and somebody could die, right? That has now been ingrained in all of us. And we're gradually, you know, training it out. So it's not a thought anymore, but ultimately that is something. And it, and, and there's still lots of people who still are, are stuck in that mode, you know, like my parents, you know, they're like very, very protective about this kind of stuff. And there's, in some cases, good reason, but in some cases it goes too far. And so when that trains your fear response to kick up, that makes social engagement and interaction with other people just immediately like setting us off, setting off the threat response from the offset. And so this, for people who have like social anxiety or people who have just not had a lot of good practice and com being comfortable and safe in social situations, or they were picked on a lot um, as kids, you know, people, it can take, a really long time for those people to feel safe and comfortable in social situations, regardless of COVID. COVID just made it way worse for those people. Um, so uh, Apollo works really well for this because it, you know, we figured out certain vibration patterns that are slightly, they're still calming, but they're slightly higher energy that seem to be really help, helpful with creativity and social anxiety um, and just calming people down in social situations. And people describe it, it's called the social vibe on the app. People just, it's one of my favorites. Um, people describe it kind of feeling like a bubbly glass of champagne with your friends or like hanging out outside in the sun or, uh, something kind of like that, you know, but just like a generally relaxing, but not sleepy experience and no hangover, no downsides, right? No hangover. Yeah. You could turn it off when you want. I, I actually, on a, on a personal note that I don't talk about all that often, um, when we, when we first discovered this vibe, I did not you know, I don't think any of us realized how useful it was, the social vibe in particular. And I, uh, we started, you know, we made like 3000 prototypes and sent them out and had lots, or we, 
you know, 3000 people had lots of people testing them and giving us feedback. And people were telling me that this was like, like the best thing that's ever helped their social anxiety and that they were able to speak publicly uh, with confidence. They'd never been able to do that before in their lives. And I was like, this is interesting. Um, I could try that for myself because I had a little bit of uh, public speaking anxiety at the time, uh, enough that I noticed it and it bothered me. And so I started to use it every time I would go on stage and talk, which started to become relatively frequent. And it was like a, a light bulb went off, like in the cartoons one day, it was like probably the first or second time that I was using it on stage. And I, maybe the first time, and this light bulb went off and it was like, do you notice it was like asking myself a question because it was right before it was right before I was about to start talking there were a few minutes people were still gathering and I was like I was like I was asking myself a question just involuntarily it was like have you ever thought about how much time you're spending thinking about what other people are thinking about you right now <laughs> and I just started to notice how much I was thinking about what everyone was thinking about me right then because when I go to talks like you know yeah, I mean, like, we're kind of thinking about the person, but not really, you know, we're just kind of getting seated and doing our thing and getting ready for the person to speak. And we want them to do a good job because if they do a good job and we're entertained and then it like, you know, it was worth the half hour, hour or whatever. And so I started to have this realization in my head that, you know, people were actually there to hear me speak and to do a good job. And that, you know, they're not like, I, I'm just like, for me to do a good job, I have to put all of my attention on just doing the thing that I'm here to do and giving the talk. If I'm 50% of my brain is thinking about what everyone's thinking about me while I'm trying to give a talk, that only leaves 50% of my brain left over for the talk, right? And it was just, it was like a math equation that just clicked in my brain. And I was like, oh, wow, that actually makes a lot of sense. And then I just started not thinking about that anymore and training myself to, to focus on the vibration when I got distracted and then to bring myself back to the center, bring myself back to the, you know, doing what I was here to do and give the talk. And my quality of my speaking went way up very quickly. And I would say within like four to six months, you know, wasn't even wearing it on most of my talks and I was doing great. And now I like several times a week. That's interesting. That it seems to have a persistent effect even after you're stopped wearing it, I imagine because of the neuroplasticity that maybe happens there in a similar fashion to exposure, you know, cognitive behavioral exposure therapy, where your neurons that fire together, wire together. So you get in that situation, you have an experience where you feel safe and comfortable speaking publicly, those neurons get triggered over and over. And then eventually you don't need the device to reinforce that anymore, which is pretty amazing kind of cognitive learning, restructuring of the brain type of experience. While we're on that note, I want to briefly ask you uh, about your interest in psychedelic therapy, because that's something we share an interest in. I've had several people on the show, including Michael Mithofer and Rick Doblin and others who I'm sure you're connected with to, to discuss this. And we're you know, running out of time, so we won't go too far into this. Maybe we can have you back and talk about it further. But I'm, I'm especially interested in the intersection for you of everything we've been talking about today, act, you know, activation of parasympathetic response, neuroplasticity, the ways in which we can mitigate the harmful impacts of stress, especially with in severe cases like uh, PTSD and, you know, soldiers coming back from war, which I know uh, it maps and the MDMA, a lot of the MDMA studies have focused on. What are some of the, what are the parallels for you since you work actively in both of these fields between you know, sensory therapies like Apollo and psychedelic assisted therapy. So I'll answer this with, with a, another personal story that I think you'll appreciate uh, and your audience. So because you mentioned Michael and, and Rick, uh, who are wonderful people. So um, I became first interested in psychedelic assisted therapy in 2012 because I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to specialize in uh, personally and in medicine. Uh, as my career. And I really, you know, it, I started to have a lot of friends who said, you know, Dave, you should really become a psychiatrist. And I wasn't really certain about that. So one of my friends who was avidly interested in the modern psychiatry sent me, you know, 10 or 12 papers on the leading psychedelic research that was being published at that time in 2012. And I stayed up all night reading these papers because they were fascinating. And I'd always been interested in studies of consciousness 
And it made me realize that in psychiatry, I could actually do what I had always wanted to do, which is study consciousness and how the brain works and how we think and feel and all and experience all of this stuff that we call life. And so um, I ended up starting to study that then uh, and then mostly just to catch up and become familiar with the literature and what was going on. And then I learned that I had to meet Rick Doblin. Uh, so we met virtually and then we met in person for the first time in 2016. And I had like 20 minutes with Rick and I was like, and Rick is the executive director of MAPS for those who don't know. And uh, he's moving MDMA through FDA trials and with great success in terms of their results. They're some of the most successful results for PTSD that we've seen with any treatment ever. Um, and it's around the corner from FDA clearance. And so, you know, I, I went up to Rick and I said, Rick, like, I'm a, I'm, like, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm seeing these people with PTSD. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm studying how these medicines work. Um, I, we need to figure out how MDMA is working because if we can understand how MDMA is working, uh, to get these dramatic healing effects in these severely, uh, afflicted, uh, veterans with PTSD, then we can rep start to replicate that effect with other tools and other techniques that are more accessible than MDMA. And he actually found that really interesting. And so he got, he allowed me and three of my uh, psychiatrist colleagues to get trained in, in, in MDMA assisted psychotherapy with MAPS uh, by Mike and Annie Mithoffer in upstate New York. And that was in, I think, 2016. And then we kicked off from the understanding of how MDMA worked clinically in that clinical setting. And then the, that in combination with the scientific research that had been done in the lab in animals at that time, showing that MDMA helps reinforce safety learning circuitry in the brain, um, that there was this core thread of safety that was coming out through all of this work. And that MDMA seemed to be working by molecularly amplifying safety circuitry in, the, in our emotional brains that help us to amplify the safety of the therapeutic container, which is that space that of trust and 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 non-judgment and acceptance between the therapists and the patient that are built with multiple sessions before receiving any medicine. And that that is the medicine's working by amplifying that safety. And so I went back to the lab and I started to um and then at least that was that was our leading theory at the time. Again, this is not fully. Uh, there, you know, all the studies are still in the works, but um, this was the leading theory at the time. So we went back to the lab and we said, okay, well, how do we make people feel safe? Soothing touch is probably the fastest way there. And so we started doing these experiments and constructing these different sound wave vibrations that feel like soothing touch that through much study eventually became Apollo. Wow. That's such a cool story. I look forward to a future study that integrates psychedelic assisted therapy and something like Apollo over, an, over a period coming. of time and see what the synergistic effects of that might be. Yeah, they're, they're coming. So we're doing studies with ketamine and Apollo currently. Um, so people can keep a lookout for those. But because Apollo is a commercial, is a consumer product, it's just a wellness product. It's not a medical device. We have over a thousand patients who have been treated over the last three years by ketamine providers using Apollo with their patients because it improves their experiences and it improves their long-term results. And so um, that's been really exciting to see that people are using it just in the wild um, with their clients. Doctors are using it with their clients and their patients. And that's really, really exciting. So that's, so there's some, a lot of promise there. Um, and we're also doing a study that in a, in collaboration with MAPS, where we're looking at integration, that therapy, therapy period where you continue to unpack and, and integrate what you're, you've learned from your MDMA experiences with MAPS, in this case, continues long after the medicine sessions have ended. Um, and so we ended up at Rick's, at Rick's, uh, it was Rick's really Rick's idea to put, get a study approved to, to look at what happens when, for, give, when you give Apollo to everyone who's been through the MAPS MDMA trials one year out, and then we track their long-term outcomes and see if it sustains remission more over time by giving them a tool that helps to boost the same pathways that MDMA is working on in a gentle way. Yeah, I imagine that it will have a significant effect just because in that parasympathetic state, we're so much more receptive and i i think you know the the neuroplasticity circuits 
are more probably more likely the the neurons are more likely to fire and re and rewire in ways that have a long term beneficial effect if we're in that place of just being more resourced and and settled. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. Can't wait. Well, this has been fascinating. Dr. Rabin, really appreciate the conversation. And where can people learn more about the Apollo device and pick one up if they're interested? So you can learn more about Apollo at um, apolloneuro.com. That's A-P-O-L-L-O-N-E-U-R-O.com or wearablehugs.com, which is what the kids call it, if that's easier. Um, if you have an iPhone, I strongly encourage you to have the Apollo experience, which is uh, a really awesome experience as, an, as a cell phone user, where we're used to our phones mostly annoying us. Um, this actually upgrades your phone to make you feel good, which is really, really fun. So download the Apollo app in the App Store. That's uh, definitely worth doing. And um, come find me at drdave.io uh, and on socials uh, at Dr. David Raven. Great. And one thing I'll say from having used this device for a while is, although many people, including me, can notice a difference right away, as the studies suggest, there's a cumulative effect. And so it's not like drinking a glass of wine in the sense that you have this kind of immediate impact and and um, it's not going to change over time. It's, it's really a, a, a type of intervention that where the benefits accumulate over time as the sleep study you mentioned indicates so you know it's important to give it enough time to actually have its effect i used to tell patients that all the time because often people are expecting you know some some a lot of pharmaceutical interventions like 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 ambien for example you take it and it affects you the way it's going to affect you that same night it doesn't necessarily change over time but this is not like that it will def it will definitely uh, the effect definitely improves and, and increases over time. So just keep that in mind if you're going to use it. Dr. Raven, thanks again. I'd love to have you back to discuss the results of these future studies at some point. And thanks for doing this important work. It's been a game changer for me and for many of my patients. So really appreciate it. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, that warms my heart. And, uh, you know, we did this, we created this to help our patients. And um, so I'm so to hear that, and I really enjoyed chatting with you. Thanks again for having me. Great. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Send your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. We'll see you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.